I want to uh, welcome you all to this virtual event where we're going to discuss racism as a public health crisis uh, in London. My name is Mpume Mpofe and I'm a member of the London ACES Hub. My colleague, Koya Cassandra Conte. Say hello, Koya. Welcome everybody. I'm Koya, I'm a drama therapist. I'm also a member of the London ACES Hub. I hope you are well, safe and warm wherever you are and are ready to, uh, for an exciting open conversation. The London ACES Hub greatly appreciates you being here with us today to address such a crucial and timely topic. Led by our um, London ACES Hub co-chairs Chiani Griozio Chin and uh, Roger Grimshaw, we as the London ACES Hub Racial Working Group uh, have put this event together to launch our call to action and to start a necessary conversation in these turbulent times. We intend to stress the urgent need to ch uh, for change that has been going on in many communities around the world and in our city. People of color in, are disproportionately affected by discrimination and, ad and adversity in ways that result in poor health and social outcomes. Increasing evidence show that these facts have systemic and institutional roots. London can do better. Uh, we can join the global effort and make the required changes to build equity for all. Recognizing and acknowledging these facts and channeling this knowledge into action and allyship is even more important for those of us in the helping professions uh, and um, as well as for people that look like me. Uh, as a middle-aged man of African descent, I, I have experienced how race, racialization, and racism have moment by moment impact on me, as well as on, pe on people who look like me. I hope the dying words of the late George Floyd uh, still ring loud and clear for you. I can't breathe. So COVID-19 and the Office for National Statistics here in the UK, um, focus on racism has shown clearly despite government denials, why black and brown people experience worse outcomes than white people in nearly every category of life, regardless of socioeconomic context. Race and racism have been killing people for a long time. Uh, experiencing racism is an adverse childhood experience. In London, as in the rest of the country, racism has been killing people for a long time through marginalization, political attacks, neglect, aggressive policing, gentrification, and through social, mental, and uh, uh, physical health care systems that struggle to respect and take care of people of color. Dr. Kamari Jones of the Morehouse Medical College sh shares a cogent definition of racism. She states that racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value uh, on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race. That unfairly advantage, disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Within this context, we at the London ACES Hub Racial Justice Working Group believe that it is important that we walk the talk and strive towards positive change in any capacity that we can. This evening, we really hope to center on and elevate the, the voices and the minds that will help frame the topic, and more importantly, find collective solutions to achieve change. I want to thank our incredible speakers for being uh, here with us today in order to lead the discussion and on the implications of racism as a public health crisis. Each of our four speakers will present for about five minutes uh, and then we'll open the conversation for questions, answers and shared insights. I encourage you to use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to say hello and where you are. Uh, let's build our community. Feel also welcome to share your views and pose questions throughout the event. Please be mindful to use the option all, panel, all panelists and attendees if you uh, would like your comments to be shared with everyone. Uh, we understand that we all have different levels of comfort with the topic today. If you are here, however, it is because you are open and ready for the, con uh, the conversation. We are a trauma-informed network and value self-care and collective care. We encourage you to share resp responsibility in creating and 
a caring and mutually respectful space uh, this evening for all. Also to reassure everyone, the questions will be asked. Um, the questions will be anonymously directed to the speakers by my colleague Koya, unless you indicate a, pro a preference to be named. Without further ado, I invite my colleague Koya to launch our call to action and set the tone for the conversation. Call to action, 26th of September, 2020, the last statement. The London ACES Hub recognizes and acknowledges that racism is an adverse childhood experience that causes deep rooted traumas, denies the full humanity and limits the opportunity to survive for individuals and communities, resulting in a loss for the society as a whole. We believe that there is an urgent and growing evidence that the individual interrelational and historical harm produced by racism constitutes a public health crisis in London. This crisis can be addressed and prevented by proactive awareness raising, empathy building and cultural systemic and structural changes. We call for support and appeal to the London government, statutory and non-statutory organizations, parents and heads of homes, children and young people, educators, multidisciplinary professionals, survivors and community advocates from all backgrounds to prevent and end the harmful consequences of racism. We have the power as individuals and a collective to make this happen. One committed step at a time to end the adverse childhood experience of racism in London. Thank you, Koya. Now it is time to hear from our special guests. Uh, the first one I'd like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Roger Grimshaw. Uh, the London ACES Hub co-chair and co-founder and a research director at the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies in London. To say a few words about the London ACES Hub, please, Roger, and uh, start our conversation by focusing on what is the state of the evidence to claim that racism is a public health crisis in London. Over to you, Roger. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to meet so many of you um, and I hope you're going to find what I have to say interesting. You know, as, as my player was saying, uh, I'm co-chair of the, of the ACES Hub, and it's a great privilege to work with a group, um, a number of whom are among the speakers today. Um, and I'm, I'm going to refer to the state of the evidence. So if, if you can show the next slide. Um, as has been said, racism is an adverse child experience and it's one of several impact on long-term health. Long-term health, this is a really big issue. Now we are an independent network um, of survivor activists, professionals from different uh, disciplines, and we try to promote awareness of all these ACEs, uh, as we call them, um, and we advocate prevention, resilience and recovery. So my first question as a researcher is about, you know, the, the evidence um, and my uh, assessment is that the evidence about racism health is mounting, but what we lack is the clarity and the detail. Much more should be done to, to take the research forward and ensuring black communities and professionals are equal partners in this endeavour. Thank you. So here are some interesting examples from very good studies, which indicate that I think the dimensions um, of the problem. Starting first of all with COVID, um, which I think many people are aware now is exposed underlying health inequalities, uh, high death rates, uh, disproportionate impact on black communities. Um, at the last census, uh, the London dis displayed even worse inequality than elsewhere. What are the mechanisms then by which racism becomes an adverse child experience? Um, and one which has been shown by a very good study based on the Millennium co Cohort found very strong direct effects of maternal experiences of racism um, on children's social and emotional difficulties. And it, it also goes further because there's also evidence, and I've quoted from the Royal College of Psychiatrists, that institutional racism exists in health services. Thank you. Um, and data, yeah, it can be deceptive. And I'm uh, quoting from a 
uh, a article by Dr. Danso, who's a London-based GP, who pointed out um, that the workforce race equality standard in her clinical um, commissioning group indicated that there was actually an overrepresentation of BME staff compared to the borough. Um, however, she asked, well, actually, how many of these people were black? And, and would white doctors ever be described as an overrepresentation? So she, she's leading um, a, 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 a movement to question how the, the, the health services are um, assessing um, health uh, inequalities within the workforce. And I think this just illustrates the extent to which knowledge, the, the, the knowledge that we use pragmatically is driven by social interests and can be biased. Um, so what needs to happen is a more thorough approach which deploys all the talents um, of all the groups inside the scientific conversation. So finally, I want to just refer to a statement from um, Leah Bukeresh and others in a very, very good study um, on, on mental health which makes this fundamental point um, that racism is a, a, a very fundamental determinant of ethnic inequalities in health. And it does, it does so through differential exposure to a number of factors, socioeconomic, so we're talking about poverty, environmental, so we could talk about housing, pollution and so on. Also the psychosocial, thinking about family distress, and equally uh, the issues to do with bias in healthcare. So in this kind of rapid run through, um, I believe then that, the, that we can show that racism is an emerging and strong public health uh, crisis, but we need to do more to clarify it. And therefore the hub's very eager to work with other groups um, to document uh, and look what's happening in particular areas as well as London as a whole. Uh, we are organizing a conference in 20. 22. Um, so to discuss this project, please message us. Thank you very much. Roger, Roger, thank you very much for that. So I'm taking a couple of points. The evidence needs to be collated, number one, and the multi uh, multidisciplinary nature of it makes it fragmented. I hope in the discussion we can pick up those points. Thank you very much for, for that, Roger. So now I pass on uh, the word to Leroy Logan, MBE a retired Met uh, superintendent and founder of the Black uh, Police Association. Leroy has, has, re has recently been played uh, by John Boyega in Red, White and Blue, part of the uh, acclaimed Small Act series uh, by Steve McQueen. We highly recommend it if you haven't watched it. Uh, Leroy will focus on racism and public health implications related to policing, criminal justice and uh, community. Over to you, please, uh, Leroy. Great, thank you very much for the introduction. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, policing has always been a contentious issue from the first time it was formed in 1829 by Sir Robert Peel. But the key part of setting up the police in 1829 by Sir Robert Peel, he said the police are the public and the public are the police. It's a very simple concept that doesn't need massive variation. It's about relationships. So if policing has an adverse impact on relationship with the public, then it's not fit for purpose. And we've seen the impact of policing in a negative way. But I, I would like to say before I go into that, that there's nothing wrong with police that cannot be fixed by what's good in it. So all the integral parts are there. It's just a question of getting the right leadership and the right statement of intent and the right narrative to ensure that policing does become a service and not an occupying force. But the journey started inadvertently badly in terms of race and equality by as far back as the Windrush generation. My parents was part of that generation and they were the real recipients of heavy handed policing just because of the color of their skin after the Second World War through the SUS law, which was a variation of the Met Police Act of 1866. And it's it was clear that people were traumatized by the type of policing because they could be arrested on suspicion of about to commit an arrestable offense. So that 
for, for years, they were called the thought police because that meant you have to read people's mind to have that power of arrest. And then that continued throughout the 60s and 70s. I myself was stopped and searched as a youngster in school premises. Now, fortunately, that draconian act was um, repealed and replaced by the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. And as a result of that, we saw a more accountability because with a sus law, you could be arrested, detained for days before you even go to court and from court straight into uh, the penal system. At least with, um, with the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, PACE, you had clear guidelines as around that person's custody, how they uh, are kept, etc., and review periods. So the person who was arrested, their, their trauma could be assessed, even though the, the officers no, were not doing that with a, a real um, lens of understanding. So the Police and Criminal Evidence Act improved things, but still not enough. We saw through the death of Stephen Lawrence and um, the McPherson inquiry into how that case was dealt with incompetently, corruptly, and racistly, we had recommendations. And so you, you saw an improvement through those recommendations, especially through independent oversight from the Stephen Lawrence Steering Group, chaired by Jack Straw and subsequent Labour Home Secretaries. Because what gets measured gets done. And when chief constables are held to account, everything has a different level of scrutiny and, of course, uh, delivery. So you saw a, a significant improvement in stop and search, not only in the number, but the, the, the actual hit rate. So more people that were stopped and searched were actually had some sort of follow up. And it wasn't a fishing expedition. There was not a, an increase in the use of cuffs. And you started to see a, a real improvement um, through those difficult encounters. But also, you started to see a greater emphasis on community engagement policing, citizen-focused policing. And that built up up until 2009-10 um, because safer neighbor teams were brought in. And that was one sergeant, two constables, three police community support officers. And that built um, ring fence teams that really held um, that community engagement. So you didn't see as much adverse stop and search. And we started to see better relations with the community and better um, intelligence to make officers more proactive. So they're pursuing the right people, the ones that are committing the crime are not impacting on people who don't, are going about the lawful business and are being traumatized, especially young people. And we saw that when, um, the new government in 2010 was elected and there was the recession. We saw the safer neighbor teams significantly re reduced and there was that gap between the police and community. That in itself created problems in terms of who fills that gap. The void was filled by dysfunctional role models and an exponential growth in gangs. And we've seen how um, young people have been siphoned into these negative peer groups and gangs leading up to county lines that are proliferating up until this very time and crime and violence has in increased. Unfortunately, because the number of officers has reduced significantly nationally, 20,000 officers has reduced. We have now got firefighting type of policing. And that may means that they are just reacting from one incident to another. So that, that they've gone back to the default as in the SUS law of believing they can stop and search their way out of a problem or mm. arrest their way out of the problem. And that's incurring more trauma mm. on um, especially young people because the yeah. impact then is reducing trust and confidence. And that's why I've been running a, a charity called Void Chief from, from, for the last 20 years. And every time those young people say they're over police and underprotected, they, they feel dehumanized, they feel devalued. And that has caused so many massive impacts on them that they don't trust the police. In fact, they've gone the other way to um, sometimes buy into the street justice instead of the criminal justice. So we've got a negative cycle of events and what, uh, and in closing, what has made this even worse? 
by the George Floyd um, lynching, as far as I'm concerned, especially yeah. that officer had the same oath as me, swearing to protect and serve. Well, the, that was the last thing on his mind. And then, yeah. of course, the whole Black Lives Matter. And that, I believe, is starting to address these issues. And there's this call to action, I believe, this hub can do some massive work to get trauma-informed policing back on the agenda and to ensure that citizen-focused policing is fit for purpose for the 21st century. Leroy, thank you very much. We, we want to take those issues in the discussion, so we'll be able to revisit that. There's a question there uh, around the name of the charity, so if you could go into the, uh, into the chat and add that too. Let me qu very quickly bring in uh, Felicity, Dr. Felicity D. Zuluata to share her thoughts on adverse childhood ex uh, experiences, exactly what that means, and how it connects to racism. Felicity is the Emeritus Consultant Psychiatrist in, in Psychotherapy at the South London and Mosley NHS Trust and an Honorary Senior Lecturer in Traumatic Studies at King's College. Felicity, over to you. So I am delighted to be here, and I am delighted so many of you uh, can see. Uh, we move to the next slide because my role is going to be to share with you what is this ACEs, which I'm often asked. Well, let's think uh, one of the things that's very interesting that has been mentioned in a way is that the most terrible cause of trauma is in fact everyday discrimination. What you experience all day from the moment you get up in the morning to the moment you get to, to go to bed is these permanent little things that make you feel left out, outcast, etc. And this is what causes what we're going to talk about, ACEs. Next slide, please. Adverse childhood experiences are usually repeated experiences suffered by children or adolescents during which they experience a situation of terror without any solution due to the emotional absence of a supportive, loving figure, usually the parent, because we are born to have attachments to parents and parents to attach to us. And if that doesn't happen when we need a parent, when we're frightened or hungry or whatever, we then have a very big effect on our bodies and minds. Trauma and as the first three years of life are the most dependent states, this is when the biggest traumas implant themselves in the mind and cause changes. Next slide, please. And here is the list of the first study that was carried out, which led to all that we are following through today. These were uh, the, uh, the, it was found out by a very careful doctor who wanted to know why people left his uh, clinic for loss of weight. And he found out through asking people that these were the things that were behind them physical abuse of all the different kinds of abuse that you know about, including neglect, emotional neglect is very, very important. And all the situations in the home that lead to children being neglected and hurt, which are domestic violence that we now know is happening big time, drugs and alcohol, mental illness, parental separation, divorce, and somebody in prison, of course. And others have since been added by WHO due to the community that these people are in, peer violence, bullying, community violence, war, and racism finally is beginning to come in, poverty and more, but racism is beginning, but it's often still left out. Next slide, please. So what happens in very short term is what happens when uh, this, the brain is put in this situation of danger a toxic immune response takes place, leading to a damage that leads to problems with future learning and health, and an increased vulnerability to stress. So your stress is already there, and on top of that, there's an increased vulnerability, leading to increased levels of physical and mental disorders, such as suicide and violence. And these are exacerbated by the fact that a mother and the other epigenetic, these are called epigenetic factors, the genes don't change, but something happens with a traumatized mother that affects the little one so that he or she becomes more vulnerable to stress. And so this goes down the generation. So you can imagine with slavery, how that impacted again and again. Next slide, please. And this leads to what you see here, which summarizes it. 
here down below this triangle, you have the adverse childhood experiences right at the bottom. Then you, that causes disrupted development of the neural system and immune system and, and uh, other things in the body. That leads to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, means people have these different problems. That means we try and adapt to that, for instance, taking drugs or uh, other forms of addiction are ways in which we adapt to the fact that our system, our body isn't working properly in relation to what's going on in our lives. And then di and disease that leads to diseases and disabilities and social problems that we all have hearing about today. And with people with many, many ACEs, it can lead to a real shortening of life. I want to add that um, the big issue is that these are probabilities. These are not, if you have somebody and you do a study of their, uh, you know, you find out how many ACEs they have, that doesn't mean that that's going to be their, their lot. It means it's a very high probability, but you then must measure the resilience factors in that family, that person. That is just as important as the, as the negative ones. If there's resilience of support, then these people are, fine, uh, are much better. Felicity, thank you very much for that. Um, at this point, I need to explain uh, that our colleague, Dr. Lucy Carter, was supposed to be taking over at this point. Unfortunately, Lucy lost her dad this morning, so she's not been able to join us. Uh, we've sent um, our messages to her and uh, of support all day, and I hope you will understand. Um, but saying that Jonathan, uh, Dr. Jonathan Tomlinson has stepped in at very, very short note. Uh, Jonathan uh, is also a member of the London ACES Hub and a London GP, uh, a lecturer in PA studies. Uh, Jonathan will focus on racism and health and will share some of the challenges presented by patients and experienced by uh, uh, GPs at the front line. And I'm sure J Jonathan will introduce a colleague that he's brought with. Over to you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I introduced uh, Lucy to the London ACES Hub and I've been good friends with her since we were students a long time ago. Um, so I'm, I'm honoured to be standing in her place today. Um, I, I, at the very short notice, I rang around uh, and spoke to some black colleagues, uh, some black patients and black members of staff um, about this talk um, just to get their insights. Uh, and I'm very grateful to Sharon, who I think is watching uh, today, um, for, for hearing um, what I was going to say. So I have four points to make. First of all is that in health and care and medicine, we, we don't talk about medicine. I, I was a medical student in the 90s. I've been a practicing doctor for 20 years. We haven't started talking about racism really until the George Floyd Black Lives Matter movement. You can spend all that time in healthcare and not once mention race or racism. And I think a lot of that comes from uh, Robin D'Angelo's point that nobody wants to upset white people. Um, so you don't mention racism in case a white person in the room says, are you calling me a racist? Um, so we have to start talking about that and we have to put those sensitivities aside and start to listen to the experiences of patients and colleagues uh, of racism that they experience as clinicians, as staff members, and as patients and families. Uh, and that way is the only way that we can learn about it. Second point is about representation. I'm a GP in Hackney, which is very multicultural. There's, there are only a handful of black GPs, and there are only two black GP educators in Hackney, um, which is completely unrepresentative. And I think it's difficult for black doctors to, to work in general practice in a hospital. You will find uh, black colleagues. If you go to an educational meeting in a hospital, you will meet black doctors but it's very different in general practice. And we need to take responsibility for that and make our own place more welcoming, uh, more acceptable, the kind of place that black uh, and other minority ethnic doctors want to work. But there's a particular problem, I think, with black Afro-Caribbean uh, medical students and doctors choosing uh, general practice. And that's for us to work on and to make patients feel kind of more welcome uh, in our surgeries. The next point is I think we need to be specific. If any of you saw the amazing series, um, I May Destroy You, there's a scene where a young woman visits a doctor and assumes that because she's black and from London that she's Afro-Caribbean, but she's not. 
Uh, she's from an African background. And the experiences of the Windrush generation, uh, children who came over more recently with African parents, um, people who come from India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or uh, Afghanistan or wherever, they're, they're, they're very different experiences. And we have to stop this lumping all black minority ethnic people together and assuming that they all share the same experience of trauma, displacement, racism, and so on. And we, we need to be more sophisticated. So that would be my third, third point. And finally, as a GP, the thing that, the, the, the thing that I have with my patients um, is trust. And trust uh, can only be earned by demonstrating a commitment uh, to stick with patients and communities uh, by GPs choosing to work with, with patients in communities that are minority ethnic, sticking there for a long time and developing those relationships. And trust for people whose experience of authority is, is that you will be taken advantage of, you won't be taken seriously. You know, I'm a representative of authority working in East London, I'm a middle-aged white guy. I have to rep, so I have to work hard to earn the trust of people. And you can do that by sticking around uh, in one place and by by listening, not trying to explain stuff, but by just hearing people out and hearing their stories. So we need to talk about racism, we need better representation, we need to be specific about who we're talking about, uh, and we need to earn the trust. Uh, and that way we might go some way to fixing some of the problems of racism in medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that. Uh, lots of lots of uh, ideas and concepts that have been introduced there. Uh, we're going to open it now for for your views, your thoughts, your insights. Um, and as I said, we're using the uh, we're using the Q and A and the chat function for that. So I'm hoping that you can start putting some ideas in there, things that that you resonate with from what has been said, as well as uh, questions that you want want answered. And thirdly, uh, some ideas that you think need to be considered in in this discussion. Let's just fly through those as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, Koya, anything that's come up in the in the in the um, uh, chat yet? Um, nothing that's come up in the chat. What I would like to suggest, if that's possible, is for us to just have a moment's silence. Um, for those of us that have um, lost other oh. people during the COVID-19, um, through any other traumas and every other way that might have happened. So I was just wondering if we could all just take a moment, just have a minute silence and take it from there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to flag a few points and then I'll throw them to one or two of you. For me, when I look at the notion of, of uh, racism and its impact on, on uh, uh, people of color, uh, it needs to be understood, certainly for me as a system. If you remember the quote that I read from Dr. Kamara jo uh, Jones, it is a system. So a lot of us tend to think of racism as the interpersonal uh, uh, failure and abuse, which I define as as uh, uh, hate speech or uh, where people are prejudiced. For me, racism is around this issue of a system. And as, as Kamara Jones defines it, it, di it, it does three things. Number one, it disadvantages some individuals and communities. So that's the one part of it. The, the uh, opposite side of it is that it advantages other individuals and, and communities. 
So there is nothing that this community has done which causes them to be disadvantaged. But at the, same, at the same time, those that are disadvantaged are being disadvantaged for the benefit of those communities who, for no other reason except how they appear, what we call race, they are advantaged as individuals and communities because of that. But there's that third and fi fundamental point that it saps the energy, it saps the creativity out of society. We're spending our lives trying to understand and justify what is going on. And, and, and the point that you made, Jonathan, around the issue of trust in the consulting room and in, in the, in the uh, 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 encounter between patients and doctors. A critical thing for me is to understand that the lack of trust is itself part of the reasons why we need to address it. But in addressing it, we need to understand it as a result of institutional and, structural, and structures that have been put in place, which cause us not to trust one another. So the whole issue around the vaccines and the lack of trust is there is because of a, histor of a history that we need to take into account to understand that until we address the racism and the disadvantage, the trust will not happen. So it's not as if we address the trust to overcome the racism. We have to address the racism to, or to overcome the trust. I don't know how, whether one or two of you would like to say that before we move ahead. Uh, could I just say something? Sure. Yeah, uh, um, as I touched on, um, having given evidence at McPherson uh, in 1998 to say that the police service was institutionally racist and giving evidence of the systemic failures as opposed to individual officers' comments and behaviour, and not necessarily to uh, the community, but to their black and minority ethnic colleagues. Um, it was always an issue when officers would take on this personal vulnerability. I'm not racist. My best friends are black. I work with black people and we get on fine. And it, it had a, a massive impact in terms of the overt racism because those recommendations around how you have a better occupational culture, how you, you, you start to look at the recruitment, retention, progression issues to have a more reflective organization so that it, you're better equipped to build bridges than barriers with the, the communities that may not trust you because they're not easily converted in that, that style of policing, which, as I said, has a very enforcement and emphasis, but once you, you, you saw people push back on that to bring on this, well, this individual accusation are not systemic, then they felt there is this, um, how can I say, justification to swing, all, swing the pen pendulum all the way back. And where that's really manifest itself is since Brexit, because since 2016, hate crime has gone through the roof and it's, it hasn't really leveled off. Now, that's in, that's in the public. So the police are a reflection of the public and the type of people that are attracted to policing are very enforcement driven. It, it, it's reinforced by the occupational culture. So invariably people assimilate into that, into the norms and values of it. And consequently, they created this vicious cycle of greater enforcement, lack of empathy, and anything against that or to move it on, they see it's political correctness gone mad. They said that with McPherson, they said that with all sorts of um, issues. At least in June McPherson, we did affect their behavior, but now a lot of officers are feel emboldened, they um, feel untouchable and accountable and this leadership in the organization has not held it to account. And I'll say in closing, it's quite the opposite. The commissioner, um, Chrisetta Dick, who I've known for 20 years, um, who was brought in to, back into the Met to do the McPherson stuff. And here she is 20 years later, being quite counterproductive and saying that institutional racism is not helpful. She's actually inadvertently emboldened these officers because they're saying, well, if the boss says we're not institutionally racist, then we're not 
um, individually racist, um, you know, there's nothing to, to fear. And we've now got this real um, growing gap between the police and especially minority communities who are the ones that are disadvantaged, as you quite rightly say. And we, we, we now the timing couldn't be worse because of it's, it's actually going against Black Lives Matter. And then the other thing is, which was, I think, was a real slap in the face for not only the Lawrence family, but the whole black community when they said, well, we're not going to investigate the Stephen Lawrence case anymore. And that's an iconic case that the black community look at as being, you know, for change. It wasn't just for the two that has been arrested and the other three um, suspects still outstanding, but it was for change. And that for me is the real issue now, how these officers feel emboldened, yeah. Brexit and the lack of leadership. Okay, Leroy, thank you for that. Uh, I just need to respond to one quick question and, and uh, we'll try and make a move because we still have uh, to explore these things. There's a question that's been put around uh, the, the, how we're constituted as a group here. Uh, and I, I just need to explain that uh, when we were sensitive to, to the issues of how we, uh, the, um, the representation of the panelists came about, and there would have been more of us people that are uh, uh, melanin full, I think. Uh, um, melanin quite, rich. Yeah, melanin rich people, except that uh, unfortunately for us, Lucy dropped out at the, at the last minute and uh, jo Jonathan gra graciously stepped forward. So we're sensitive to those things uh, because we mean it when we say we want to make this co these conversations meaningful. So bear with us with that. If you're seeing uh, Chen is sitting in there, Chen is looking after our tech to make sure that all of us can concentrate on the discussion. Thank you for that, uh, Chen. So uh, we're sensitive to those issues and um, we like the challenges that come that come to us uh, on that basis. So uh, let, let me let me move us forward, and then we'll we'll keep talking as we do this. May I just say um, yeah. we have quite a few questions coming up and in question and answer and chat um, that we will definitely address in our next conversations as we move along. Okay, cool. Okay, so the, those are some of the challenges and, and uh, as uh, Leroy was indicating here, there are a lot of areas that we need to explore. The critical thing for us is, is as we're saying, to be here to have the conversation. So as part, of, as part two of this, um, uh, I would like to invite each speaker to give a brief example of good practice to address and prevent the problems related to racism as a public health crisis in London. Uh, and here are some, uh, some questions that we're trying to answer. Uh, how do we move forward? So we have talked about these things for a long time. How do we move them forward? What, what do we, who needs to understand and grasp the situation uh, for it to be remedied properly? Uh, and can London lead the way? Those are some of the questions that we're suggesting that is, as the speakers, um, uh, you, could, you could tackle those. Who's gonna go first? If you don't do that, I'll make you volunteer, guys. Come on, speak up. Well, I think uh, following my talk, what I think is the most important thing that I have been particularly interested in is to ensure that families have the support that they need so that they can bring up children to be healthy and well and develop a, a, a secure attachment, as we call it, be secure and healthy children and have what everybody else has. And that is uh, something that I'm focusing on very much. And uh, that is what, and it should be much uh, cheaper. Ner you know, nurseries available for everybody, mothers and fathers supported if they can't get the money, they must have their credit that's now been removed. All these things are absolutely vital because that's where the first, the brain is going to be the future of us. Yeah, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for that. Two things that I can use to respond to that. Number one, and both of them come from the, po the US poet, Gilles, the, the late Gilles Scott Heron. He has two tracks. One is, one is, is where he says, hey, a home is where the hate is. So we need to address that. And secondly, he's got another two tracks where he calls uh, on, on, on coming from a, home, from a broken home. Uh, ch uh, chapters one and two, brilliant stuff that talks about the positive side of it. Thank you for that, Felicity. Uh, Jonathan uh, or, or Roger? Yeah, thank you. Um, as, I, as I kind of indicated, I just, I think that, I mean, it would be a great idea to 
conduct some kind of audit um, of inequality in health um, across London. But we have to think about methods that properly address the questions that black communities and professionals are asking. So you have to find the, the method of posing the questions before you go out and collect it. It would be quite useless um, without that element. And I mean, I've been looking at a kind of an interesting project in Toronto a few, a few years ago, which began, began to uh, search for data, but also consult. And I think that's so important, particularly because of the inequalities um, you know, in representation within within professions, that mm. to find that right, the right balance um, and the right level of involvement uh, from the communities who are most affected. Yeah, great, thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I, I was um, just thinking about a, a, a question that's come up in the chat from Sheila about how you might recognise that your what you're suffering from now could have something to do with trauma. My my experience with a big Black Afro-Caribbean community is that I've only recently re realized that a condition like lupus, which is very, you almost only see in black patients, mostly black women, is six to eight times more prevalent in people with a history of, of trauma. And, and if you take a, if you ask people about their experiences of growing up, um, then you begin to understand that it's not just a, a disease of um, of biology. It's also a condition that related very strongly to your experiences. So it's to do with biography as well as biology. And the hypertension in, in black patients, you know, it can be very tricky to treat until you realize that what they're going through is the reason that the blood pressure is up and it's not just yeah. to do with the genes or the color of their skin. Yeah. So asking what's behind the diseases that you see every day, asking about people's experiences has transformed my care and has helped patients to think differently. Um, one last example was I saw somebody with psoriasis recently it was absolutely mm. terrible and, and he used very strong drugs to treat this but we we listened to his story about how he grew up um, and it was incredibly stressful um, and it completely transformed the way he was kind of thinking about uh, what was happening to his body and gives us a much more compassionate understanding uh, of things that had seen as difficult to treat conditions. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I really like the idea of both both uh, people's biology versus their um, uh, biography. I think, I think that's that's really powerful for, for me. Leroy, do you have any any anything to say in a minute or two? I'm, I'm under pressure for time and I realize I'm not being fair with you, but I'm under a lot of pressure here. You're muted, uh, Leroy. Yeah, um, now I understand we're, we're under pressure. Um, I would like to think that what's already been um, brought in with the public health approach adopted from Glasgow, um, myself and colleagues in the Youth Violence Commission for the last few years were pushing for a violence reduction unit similar to uh, what they had in Glasgow that recognised not only the public health approach but also the trauma elements we've discussed. So even though the current London VRU is not actually adopting all of those key principles, especially um, the sort of autonomy that they should have from the mayor. Um, we, we know that it's having limited impact because it's still seen as a political tool, but mm. we're still working with them. The, the other thing is, um, I think there's a big issue around collaboration. So uh, I, I believe the practitioners that we are in, this um, LAH and other networks really need to come together. And uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. The, um, I'm working with Black Men for Change and we, we are in work with uh, the Mayor's Office, Deputy Mayor for Police and Crime, um, Sophie Linden, to look how we can develop uh, a, a community driven police framework, which again, the public health approach is front and center. So. Um, we're doing that. And also, uh, personally, I'm, I'm doing some research around the impact of stop and search and on young people, in particular, that trauma that I touched on earlier, and how it's actually creating even greater uh, um, sort of gaps between the police and the public, especially young people. And that's why we, we, we're starting to see um, 
there's no real reduction in violence because young people are not working with police to reduce it. So that, those are just a couple of things that we're uh, bringing in. Wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you for that. Let's let's open it for discussion. Uh, Koya, you mentioned that there were a few questions that were coming, uh, certain insights that I've, I've seen also pop up in here. Yeah. Uh, give me two that, that jump up for you, please, and we'll try and respond to those. Okay, so two that I have here is, well, one of them, I feel like it's, it'll be good to ask because of where Leroy is, and, and it's, a, it's a question directed for you. Um, what you're speaking about, but taking it back actually to childhood. Um, the question is, Leroy, can you remember how it felt when you were stopped and searched as a schoolboy? You're muted again, Leroy. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was traumatic. Um, I, I was actually in full uniform uh, with my trumpet case. So I just finished band practice and these officers came up to me asking me about my, my movements and uh, uh, admittedly, they weren't aggressive, but I, I just what why I thought it was worse than anything was I was being singled out because my white um, fellow students, because it was a boys' school, my fellow students were not stopped, but I was. So that that's what it's being singled out was the issue and feeling disadvantaged, whereas my white counterparts were just walking by, mm -hmm. feeling advantage. Well, you know, even if they weren't doing anything wrong, they still felt, well, uh, a, a higher status than me. Um, and and my, ex, my father actually stopped them from going into a more in-depth search of my trumpet case and my satchel and everything like that. So it, it was very, very traumatic. And I, I, I used that to equip me in when I then eventually start to use stop and search. And um, I'll give it a, an example. There was um, a young man in the, my first couple of years who always used to really be extremely, um, how can I say, cheeky, to say the least. And as a result of that, he wanted me to search him and everything. And I wouldn't do it unless I had some evidence. I wasn't going to search him because he failed the attitude test. And um, as a result of that, we started to develop banter. And here we are, 35 years later, he works with me on Voyage Youth. He's the CEO. And, and, and that's why I truly believe if you really are empathetic, you know your, your pastoral side and, and building relationships, then stop and search is actually the last resort. You yeah. Know? yeah. And especially if you have to use force, handcuffs and anything else. Yeah. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, uh, Leroy. There, I often talk around the concept of compassionate policing, which which is what you referred to earlier. Yeah. Um, let, let's uh, try another one or two questions. And yeah. sorry, the other uh, presenters, I'm just shutting you down because I'm trying to move forward. Sorry, go ahead. That's fine. Thank you, Leroy. Um, so we have another question. And Paul May spoke about racism and and as a system, which I thought was very instructive. What I want to know is how do you go about dismantling structural and institutional racism? I haven't got enough time. That is my that is my favorite subject. As I said, there are three levels to understand it. It's at the personal, interpersonal level. There is stuff that we can do to show up as anti-racist. Speak up, just something as simple as speaking up. So if you are in the privileged few, if you are Caucasian, if you are white, you have no idea what the, the, the privilege that you have by being white represents. As soon as you speak up, that's it. The, and I haven't got enough time to get into it. That's the first thing. When it comes to the structural stuff, we need to understand how we got here. Let us look at the history of how we got here. We didn't just arrive and start talking about racism in the last five years. This thing has gone on for a very, very long time. And that's how the structures have been created. So we need to understand how the structures were, were created and why they were created. What were they trying to take advantage of? Um, uh, I, I am through and through Zimbabwean. I know that the, the British went into Southern Rhodesia in order to get a whole bunch of stuff which they needed. So so in order to be able to do that, they created a political system which, which supported that. You are not going to fix that until you take a step back to understand what was in, in the design of the structure. Finally, when it comes to the institutional stuff, 
I think Jonathan made reference to, to, to that point. What are we looking for when we go to the NHS in terms of being anti-racist? What can we ask individual GPs to do? What can we ask NHS trusts to do? And there's a whole bunch of things that we can do. My favorite expression these days has been, what can you do to show up as anti-racist? And I haven't got enough time here, but through the, the, through the hub, come back and we, we can have more conversation about how you actually deploy that in real terms. Let me stop there because I'll talk forever. I've got um, another question. Well, statement sort of quest and question in one. Um, there's a lot There's a lot of talk about ACEs and trauma-informed work since Kids Company began to really raise the issues of brain development, impact of violence and trauma on children and young people. And yet schools, criminal administration, prisons, hospitals, police, and all statutory institutes amongst others fail to either understand or acknowledge racism and its impact as part of people's experience. This is not accidental or a simple omission. Surely it is an extension of the underpinning system. Yes. Challenging, making explicit and exposing the structures and practices in which I, this person often finds themselves involved in, for example, needs to be more common, but it's extremely risky and difficult. How can we support and encourage take the hit for each other more? That's for everyone, actually. Absolutely, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Felicity. If you can be very, very brief, you're still muted, Felicity. If you can be very brief. Please. I would like to bring up that, 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 that point is very relevant to me. I was working as a consultant psychiatrist running a trauma service with 50% of my patients were registered uh, from refugees and black and all different places in the world. And I worked, I am the person who taught the lady running kids company, Camilla Batmangelic, all about ACEs attachment and all that. It was my teaching. And uh, so she referred a patient who was a, a young lady who had very, very serious problems, very, very serious with, so serious that I felt like as if she was white she needed referral to a unit where they would help her deal with that problem because she was at risk in the community. Her father was a very abusive and a, a rapist and all sorts of other drug issues. And then suddenly I found myself the, the, uh, the, and the, the end of a, four, a gang of four managers trying to destroy me and to say that I was doing something very, very wrong. I spent a year fighting it. The reason is that I never understood why, and now, of course, I do. It was that Maudsley Hospital did not want to have to deal with all the referrals that Kids Company would have sent to them should this young woman had the treatment that she wanted. I nearly lost my job. I fought it, and I'm here as a, a founder of Hub because I believe that racial justice has to happen in all areas and uh, particularly in psychiatry, and I am doing my bit there. Wonderful. Felicity, thank you for that. Um, Roger, do you do you want to say something? Jonathan, you want to say something? All of, either of you has 30 seconds. If I answer Susanna's question quickly, uh, in the Q&A, she, she asked whether black and minority ethnic staff in hospitals were forced to work in dangerous uh, conditions during COVID. Uh, the evidence we know of is that black and minority um, NHS staff do work in the least uh, you know, the, the lowest status jobs um, throughout the NHS and the, the evidence that there's been a very good study looking at infection rates among staff in big hospitals uh, and the, the staff members who had highest rates of infection with coronavirus were housekeeping, who were almost entirely black and minority ethnic, much higher than the doctors because they were still seeing the patients every day, but they weren't given the adequate protective gear and they were seeing lots and lots and lots of different patients. Uh, and their rates were uh, sort of two or three times higher even than intensive care staff. Great. Rog? Well, I think all I, all I, all I would add really uh, to the good points that have been made already is it's, it's finding the space to have that discussion because I think it's quite easy um, for people who are in authority who are kind of questioned to seek ways of kind of shutting down the conversation. Um, so I, I think that's the most important thing to, to have the right to have the conversation. Mm. Um, 
and and to explore the issues because they are really really complex as as everybody's been saying you know it's um and there are kind of interactions and therefore it takes more time to to explore what those issues really are um so it, it, it's 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 about it's really about um the empowerment to start the conversation and the commitment to continue with it yeah okay uh, just just my two p's worth in respect of the, exactly the same question that jonathan referred to you i think you said it's coming from sheila around numbers within the nhs and so forth i think that that goes to to the question of two points one of this on the structural side of racism and the other one on the institutional side on the structural side of it uh, in, in, in a paper that I read um, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, there were numbers that were being looked at about uh, research investment grants into uh, sickle cell, which is pre seen predominantly as, as an African and African Caribbean type of disease, sickle cell disease, versus, uh, please correct me here, Jonathan, is it cystic fibro fib fibrosis? Mm -hmm yeah that there was 10 times more investment going into cf than was going into sickle cell and the the explanation that was given was that uh the number of people researching the number of people interested in researching uh, uh, uh cf was greater than uh, sickle cell because uh, CF is generally defined as a disease that is suffered by wh white people and Caucasians, while sickle cell is generally seen as a disease that is affecting African and African Caribbean people. So on the surface, it appears like there is injustice and so forth. Uh, at the structural level, what we're saying is how have people arrived at, be at beginning to study those diseases? And that's the structural elements of those that come from um, uh, uh, those from people of color and those and those communities do not have the opportunities to be able to aspire to that because their starting point is that much further behind. And we need to address how we get the numbers up so that we can balance the numbers off in terms of the structural issues to have more people or, uh, from from uh, communities of color who are interested in, in researching these things and understanding that. That's the first thing. At the institutional level is that when research uh, uh, ideas are being put forward, the panel that sits to adjudicate them certainly within the NHS, tends to be predominantly white and Caucasian. And therefore, they will identify more with some of those um, ideas that are being developed or on this side on the basis of who's putting the ideas forward. Whereas when you are coming and trying to address a poorly understood disease, such as sickle cell, there are going to be institutional issues that we need to address. That's the kind of debate that I think we need to start having. I'm not saying that that, that, that paper is correct, but I am saying those are the types of discussions that we need to have to address the issues of numbers. It's not just about how many people are in the institutions. It's how many people are in there at the various levels of the organization and why, and how do we even that? And, and what, what has come out is for me is the idea that we enrich our organizations when we are able to do that. that that's just my, my, my suggestion on it, but we would need more time to explore those things. Uh, Koya, let's take uh, one more question, I think, and then we'll, we'll wind down. I actually have a statement um that can be answered by everyone it says here um it's clear that um you know children can have a secure attachment at home black children melanin rich children can have a secure attachment at home and then when they go out into the hostile environment they don't understand the daily on and don't understand the daily onslaught of racism um and growing up in London and the effects that this has on their mental state when they actually become adults. So I just wanted to put that out to everyone actually. And yeah, and what's your feet, what's your thoughts and feelings on that statement that was made? Can, can I answer, answer that? Yep. Sure. I did, um, in response to the Black Lives Matter, I, I had a meeting with some black patients, um, uh, some black students some black GP uh, trainee uh, and a black receptionist. And we, we went around and we invited people to tell stories about their experiences of racism. And for, for many of them, it was the first time they'd been invited to do this, to actually 
talk about what it was like being stopped and searched, what it was like being teased at school, what it was like to have teachers telling them that they shouldn't think of applying to be to medical school because kids like them didn't do that. But it was the first time they'd been invited to share their stories and had been heard and listened to. And the, and the people in the audience were told, you can ask questions and you can listen, but you're not there to, to give any advice or try and explain their stories to them. Uh, and it was incredibly powerful. Um, and as a, an exercise, anybody can do it. You don't need any skills. You just need to facilitate and you need to listen seriously to, to people's experiences. And it was, it was very powerful. Thank you. Could I just chip in there? Um, just to say, um, a big part of this issue is around identity. And invariably, you get your identity from your home. Hopefully, it's not part of the ACEs and, and, and the dysfunctional elements. But if you, you've got a, a reasonable, loving home that nurtures you, you, you get a stronger sense of identity. But even, um, even as a child, I, I still had that crisis of identity and how it played out in um, so many aspects of my life. What counteracted that, I, I went to Jamaica in my primary school stage for four years, and that gave me a strong sense of identity in terms of, I saw black doctors, nurses, teachers, and police officers. So that's why when I came back, I had a clear sense of who I was and I could do anything I wanted to do because I've seen it. Because if you've seen it, you can be it. If it's close enough to you and you're immersed in that, then you get a strong sense of self-worth and, and, and knowing your capabilities. And that's the sort of things that um, inspired me to set up Voyage Youth because those rights and responsibilities and knowing you can be changing your environment and not just become a victim of it, whether it's in the home or on the streets or whatever, is, is a key part of our BTEC level two. Uh, for year nine students so that they develop positive peer-to-peer -peer mentoring in the home and on the streets so that they in themselves create a lot of the solutions that we really need, especially when it comes to um, the, the, the activity and violence and, and various forms of crimes on the streets. So I, I think a key part of this is identity. And with social media, identity can be distorted in so many different ways. And we just got to be, again, talk about those, that factor, the social media factor, how it can divert people from knowing who they really are and taking on something totally different. Yeah. Perhaps we... um, yeah, let me just ask uh, Felicity and then Roger, you'll have the, the closing word as we come to the end of the session. I just want to, I, we've been talking about lots of big ideas, but I was wondering what we could uh, offer the, the people who have come today. And I was thinking if they could sit, give us some ideas of what they feel would be really helpful. I was thinking of Leroy's uh, uh, age, what do you do, Leroy? I was thinking of Jonathan's idea of providing a space, a safe place where people could come and, uh, and, uh, and look at these issues. What have I been through? Because if you can talk safely about what you've been through, and have a sense that it's respected and that it's valued and then it gives you the energy to go out and then do other things that go towards developing this sense of identity and perhaps we should also have little help financial helps to send people back to their home countries so that they have those experiences that Leroy found so helpful so <laughs> I'm just thinking that this is something that we must address at a much more simple level. When is tackling the institution is very difficult and one needs a lot of power to get there. Thank you, Felicity. Roger? Well, thank you, Mapumi, and, and everyone who's attended um, today. I just feel that the, the, the energy in this conversation has been um, so illuminating and um, I, I'm, I'm very keen, you know, that the guests who have come to us today, um, have joined us today, um, can become friends um, and together we can move in a very positive direction. I mean, certainly as a hub, we are a very small network. Um, we are institution, institutionally trying to develop um, our network so we can do more things. 
hold more events, um, to, and to work with you on, particularly on this project, which is um, so, so, so important um, so that we can uh, reverse the negative trends um, and change the relationships which um, are so um, aversive. So, um, so thank you for being here today. Do contact us. Remember, we have ongoing plans and we would very much like you to be part of it. So thank you for attending. And you know, we hope to be in touch with you as soon as possible. Uh, thank you very much, Roger. Um, just as we finish, and I will hand over to my co-chair, uh, Koya, in a minute, or in less than a minute, uh, a feedback uh, format will come to you immediately after this, uh, this uh, session ends. Please do us a favor, fill it in and get it back to us so we can get better the next time we're getting together. Uh, for me, a critical thing that I have learned at the end of such sessions is people often come to me and say, how can I, how can I be a, a positive help in getting things sorted out? How, how, how can I uh, participate in helping people attain equity and, and inclusion? For me, simple answer is um, we talk about racism at the interpersonal level, we talk about it at the structural level, we talk about it at the institutional level. Ask yourself the question, when, whatever environment you are in, how is racism, how is the system operating here? Uh, if you're Caucasian, ask yourself the question, how is my white privilege helping me here? What advantages am I getting? If you are like me, of, or a, a melanin-rich person, to ask the question, how, how is my internalized racism uh, working against me and how do I address that? And, and finally, that question of how do we get the institution to work better? The London ACES Hub will continue to collect data to investigate the links between racism and public health in London throughout 2021. We invite you all to join in strength and cooperate with us in this project. Uh, if you have any further thoughts or re uh, relevant data to share, do contact us, please. Um, our website is www.londonacesHub.org or by e email at contact at uh, londonacesHub.org. We will have another racial justice open conversation in March 2021. And if you're interested, you will, re uh, sorry, if you're interested, you will receive um, uh, by email in the coming days a C CPD certificate for today's uh, webinar. Let me now hand over to you, um, uh, Koya, for you to close for us, please. Um, so I'm just going to make this short and sweet. I first of all just want to thank everybody that has attended today. Um, this is crucial what we're embarking on here and what we've, we've begun here. Um, so I'm hoping that people got a lot of takeaways that they can go away and do things with and actually action some something, even if it's a small thing within self. Um, and that we will be taking in all the questions that have been asked. So unfortunately, we weren't able to ask all of them, but we do have them and we will be looking at those and looking at ways that how we can implement those things and help those things to become um, real, um, actioned. So yeah, our call to action today is, we've got work to do, so let's get it done. We've started the movement, let's keep it going. And join you. us, and join us. Yeah, join us, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you.